Hi, I'm R.L. Parker, Dark Fantasy Epic Fantasy author, and this is... Christina Parker, his editor, and spousal unit. <laughs> I thought this video might be cool, might not, you know, it may not even go to the internet. Um, but I thought that I could talk to my wife here on camera, we could talk about my editing process, uh, Bathe in the Blood of Ravens, um, anything she wants to mention about, you know, going through the campaigns back in the day versus reading the book now. Um, she can land base me in public for having to wait 25 years for the book to be written. You know, and it, we, we're just going to ramble and, and see where it goes. And again, no script. Is that so much? <laughs> Uh, so the reality is is that uh, Rick here and I met back in February of 1996. Um, at the time, he was a DM. He had a group, um, and I was already experienced in the game. So I came as an experienced player while he was still sussing out the game. Um, I had been playing for many years by that point. Um, I remember it as a box set. I, I played it as a box set. Um, but with him as a DM, it gave me a really different perspective on the game because mostly what I had played up to that point was modules. Uh, there were a couple of off the cuff DMs, which was definitely what I preferred because while I don't mind rolling dice, I was there for the role playing aspect of it. Um, hack and slash was not my deal. And if that's what you wanted to play, cool, I'll play one, but I might not show up to the next section or next ses session. Sorry. Um, so getting in with his group was really different for me because this was a group that had been playing together for a while and I was kind of coming in as a stranger, um, but we were dating. So, you know, I automatically had an in cause that's how that works. But there's also the stigma of, oh, the DM's girlfriend. She's not gonna know what a Thacko is, forget a dex check, perception. Oh, she's probably gonna play something sleazy, which, that stereotype does tend to hold. I mean, let's be real. Any Anybody who's like, oh, my girlfriend wants to play, she's probably never even touched a D20 and didn't realize that that was anything other than a meme at this point. Um, don't get me wrong, girl gamers, hey, I'm there for you. Um, but there aren't as many of them who come with knowledge to a, a new group. Um, and I came with knowledge, so I came to bust stereotypes. Um, I knew how to do a math, all the math. I knew how to do a character sheet. I had the PHB halfway memorized. Uh, so I came in with a duelist straight out of Dragon Magazine. Um, and he let me play it. He was like, sure, whatever you want to play. Um, and for those of you who've never played that far back or, you know, just weren't around, uh, Dragon Magazine was this killer magazine that came out. It was strictly for advanced uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and it was a way to take classes and bend them. Um, so a duelist was your typical fighter, but he was a dual wield fighter, um, very well, swashbuckler. Yeah, he, he, the duelist was more referring to uh, they had two dual people. That's how they That's how made their trained. money. That's how they got most of their XP. It wasn't really through combat like everybody else. They had to, whenever they went to a town, they had to find somebody to duel them in a fight. Yes. Um, because was, the whole thing was building fame around their skill in martial combat. And, and building reputation. Yeah. So there, there was a lot of, you know, glove slapping. I challenge you to a duel! Um, the, the challenge as a player playing a duelist uh, is actually, and, I, you know, if somebody wants to recreate them and pull that, that class up to 5th edition, I'm sure it would take off like a bat out of hell. Um, the challenge as a player was that you had to try and match your opponent's wielding style. So <clears throat> if you're running into combat against a knight, and that knight is wielding a, a longsword and shield, you had to try and switch to longsword and shield in order to get your duelist bonuses. Which means you had to be proficient in multiple <laughs> yes. weapons. But that was not the problem as a player. He's lying. The problem as a player was playing this character seriously. <laughs> because it was really easy to go full-on Monty Python with this character and you know start yelling obscenities in a village just to make somebody fight you um, and hope that you know farmer joe was the one who stepped up um so Great. it was, it was actually specialized in pitchfork right, right. <laughs> Darn, i don't have that proficiency um i do have fork 
<laughs> can I roll at a disadvantage? Um, so, you know, it was one of, it was a more complex class to play because you had this honor system that you had to play as well. Um, think sort of paladin without the religion, um, pirate without, with a higher moral code. Um, I think know, Jedi would be a good comparison. Jedi is probably yeah. a really good comparison. Um, that that whole idea of protecting the weak, which was something that happened in my character, got our party in all sorts of trouble because she took offense Constantly. to things. Every campaign. Um, and she was the biggest feminist in our group. <laughs> she was the only woman player at the time, too. I was the only woman player at the time. Um, so it was really easy for me to slip in this. You said what to her? mode and and kind of play that pardon pardon the term but the, that badass bitch um which is not who i am in my real life in my real life oh, listen, I am... she is <laughs> okay i'm kind of tough she when she so <laughs> sidestep here she she's wearing a hat that she made and she sells hats she makes hats she sells hats she goes to trade shows rin fairs viking cons and sells hats and other things at those shows um She's got a lot of friends in the community. Uh, most of them look to her for help if anything physical comes up. <laughs> Moving something heavy, fending off somebody that's being a little rude, they go to her. So don't let her tell you that she's not the tough girl. She is. I'm not physical. <laughs> I am not physical, but I can make most it's people all stop. Lies. With my it's all lies. <laughs> I'm just big. <laughs> I can't help it. So the, the interesting thing from a world building perspective and from. Uh, campaign scale and scope perspective is that campaign that you joined that very first one half of the players were from guys i knew in the military the other half were from atomic comics emporium the game store down the street i literally lived a two minute walk from atomic comics um down in hampton virginia it was awesome um but that was the campaign where an army from a world i haven't explored in my writing yet melthax mm was invading and they were trying to prevent basically effectively a demonic invasion yep. of the world um and you guys succeeded um but the other two campaigns i ran with other players did not succeed uh, by the end of that campaign where she started with that duelist um i believe if i'm not mistaken i don't know if you were to this level yet but almost every player had three main characters by the end Oh, yeah, that was... And uh, I think I was running four at one a point. A lot of them had uh, followers, so once you hit a certain level in AD&D 2nd Edition, you could <laughs> hire followers. I hire never them. had followers, because I I ran... So I was running Cassie. Cassie was my duelist, um, and she was my main character. We needed a thief in the party, and we didn't have one. So I convinced Rick to let me run a quickling, yep. which... It's the flash. It's a the tiny flash. version it's, of the flash. It's a sixteen inch flash. All right. Um, they look like little halflings. Um, she played it that she, she played it that her quickling character couldn't talk slow either. She talked at the same speed she ran, so it was hilarious. She she had boots of slowness so that <laughs> she could walk with humans. Yep. Um, that was the campaign where we um, had a barbarian in the group and we figured out that she had studded armor and if the barbarian picked her up and threw her at enemies, she could run back fast enough that she didn't really take damage, yeah. but she did more damage than her quickling claymore, I, which was a dagger. Yeah. <laughs> I, I gave them a D6 plus the barbarian strength bonus to damage. Right. And a dagger is D4. Yep. <laughs> so we were like, dude, she does more damage if you chuck her across the field. <laughs> Um, and she so all of her, back all of her combat movement. actions were running. So she would take her boots off so that she was full speed. Um, and she, the barbarian would pick her up and catapult her across the field. She'd do damage and boop, right back. Um, she but, ended up becoming too much to play. So we stuffed her in a bag of holding for several weeks. She ate the, far, the party's food supply. <laughs> yeah. um, because um, but, with, with that movement speed comes a metabolism that nobody can keep up with. So... It, the reason I bring up the multiple play, multiple characters per player is we had eight players, each running three to four characters, and most of them had five to eight followers per character. Um, and the final battle took us four game days to play through. Yeah, it was nuts. It was, and those were we long started on a days. Thursday night and we ended on Monday morning. And uh, it was just constant round-the-clock rolling sessions. 
Where, where I, I broke it up and we did like sections <laughs> of the battlefield at once because it was all of the players' characters, all of their followers, and the and nearby armies from nearby places that they had roped into the conflict. And, yeah. All the familiars that everybody summoned. We had a necromancer summoning fields of undead. Yeah. And then all of these nuts. demons that were invading. And so they didn't prevent the invasion, but they thwarted the invasion and right. killed everybody and made them run. Um, so. Yeah, that was that was the one where um, I learned the value of a cat nap because I got all of my characters <laughs> in the same group. So I was like, my group's not going. Great, I'm shutting my eyes for yep. the next twenty. Yep, <laughs> and I didn't get any breaks, but I was used to it. So. Wake up and roll dice. <laughs> like. But that, that's the level of D and D campaigning we used to do. So I think when you understand that, it's obvious why, at least from a time perspective, why I didn't write back in those days. I, I didn't leave myself any time to write. If we if we weren't well, and I don't doing really that know level that you of were gaming. ready. Like that's the, the the reality is is you had this concept. Yeah. And he actually had the the first three chapters of Bathe in the Blood of Ravens written. But completely different than what I have now. Not completely different. It it has no. it has its differences, yes. But the whole the very beginning, and I don't want to give anything away, but that that tragic beginning that Lawrence yeah, that was has, the same. That is almost verbatim. But the original chapter two and three, he was at Fel Rashan taking right. classes. Exactly. Yeah. And you, I, I scrubbed you, that. I yeah. got rid of it. Well, you eventually got there. Oh, well. You, he eventually goes there, he but goes there, in but this there's, version, there's, he's just much more trained by the time he arrives. And there, well, and he becomes much more real. There's a love yeah. interest. Um, but I had read these first three chapters, and as an avid reader then and now, I was like, okay, now go write the rest of it, please. Um, and, and I never did. And he didn't. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, it would come up in conversation here and there. I'd be like, you know, you really need to write that book. Um for over 20 years. For over, for over 20, 20 years. years. Well, and the thing was, is um, I am like most geeks, I'm a bit of a pack rat. Um, so I actually had all of our character sheets, all of our treasure lists, and I was group scribe. <laughs> so I had all of my notes. So I even had most of his dungeons. Yep. Um, that he had done out on like the tiniest graph yeah. paper we could get at the time. She took him to New Hampshire. I took him to New Hampshire when he and I <laughs> went I our separate for, ways. I took it all. For nine years, I um, didn't know where they were. Because, hell, I thought if he wasn't going to write the book, maybe I should. And I never got to it, you know, like took over. And then we got married again and lockdown happened. And he said, you know, I think I'm going to write that book. And I said, hold on, I've got something for you. And I went through and started pulling out. Who do you need? Here's this character sheet. Here's this character sheet. Here's this character sheet. Oh, you need the map of that. Here's the map of that. And here's that dungeon. And here's that keep that we went to. Remember the funny little kobolds? And like all, back. all of this. I honestly, the kobold chapter or scenes in this book were probably my favorite. Um, because Rick's kobolds were the worst when we were gaming. When he couldn't figure out what to throw at us, he would throw kobolds at us. Or jibberlings. Or jib oh god, <laughs> jibberlings. Um, so it became this big joke that if you were going to game with Rick and if it was your first time, we all knew we were getting kobolds. And they also all knew how to pull, push my buttons to allow them to make one of the kobolds their permanent chef for their party. Kobold chef's the best. <laughs> so they almost always had a kobold chef. Always, Almost always. always. Um, and he would... The great thing is, is that, you know, not only was Rick's imagination really good back then to, to the point where we would completely screw his plans and go off and do something completely different in a section of the world that he had no map for, he had no town names for, he didn't even know what was west of where we so were. <laughs> back in, back in, uh, it was in the late 90s, uh, TSR, before they sold off to Wizards of the Coast, they created a program called Core Rules. And it was just a disc you'd throw on your computer, and it had all the game books. You could build characters in there. You, it, I mean, and it had for people that weren't like me and didn't have a hundred percent of the modules and the, all of the different extension books, like the Ranger's Handbook and crap like that. It had all of that in it, and you didn't have to pay a license fee for them. So you just bought the software. But for a DM, what it also had was the ability to map your entire terrain, dungeons, right, yeah. you everything. Had and so I went into this one weekend, I was prepping for a campaign. She remembers this. I was sat at my computer for like three days straight, building a terrain map. And it covered almost the entire east coast of Gargoa. 
it had all of the kingdom of Arcania and everything, and I knew where all the characters were going to be because we had already gone through private sessions with all of the players. So we get to the first game day, and the very first thing they do, so headed by her, is head west. And I did not have, okay, so I did not have player knowledge of this. So the deal was, when he was working on this, I couldn't, like, come up behind him and kiss him on the back of the head or anything like that, all right? No. I wanted to be as surprised as anybody else. And she immediately took them off the map. And I immediately, I I played my character the appropriate way. 16,000 miles of coastland, and she just walked right away from it. And three days of work went down the drain for him. So. And of course, we're, we're like, oh, well, we're going here to do this. And you could watch like his face drop. And I was nope. like, oh, we just screwed all the work that he's been doing. Sorry. Fine, you guys are getting that dungeon anyways. I'm moving it here. And he did. He was like, all right, fine. This piece goes here. This piece goes there. And guess what? Cobalts. 500 of them. Congrats. Because now I'm mad at you. <laughs> like, all right. Oh, and we didn't run sweep, sweep rolls. rolls. <laughs> we, we didn't run, run sweep rolls in most of our campaigns. So you had to kill the Cobalts one by one by one. Oh, yeah. Yep. Unlike uh, Garen and Lila's Quick fight bowling. in Blood of Ravens, they actually, Garen was using sweep rolls. Sweet rolls, yeah. Um, but, I mean, they were a blast, and you came out of it with all of these wonderful ideas and, and you know, imaginations and, and dreams and well, things wait, like that. Wait until I start writing some of the traps that were in some of my campaigns. Yeah, I can't wait. Like, dude, the whole Cobalt Keep and... and the, that was almost verbatim from it was I, I was as soon as i saw cobalt's on roller skates i was like wait what no <laughs> um but the whole like building traps in the woods too they can't they, they have the brain power of a, a great of a, a, of a, of great, a pomeranian of a <laughs> um, but so they tried <laughs> there was um I, I know back in the 80s and 90s a lot of dms that that i you know talked to or that i gamed with you know, when I started gaming in the 90s, I, I had always heard about, you know, Tinker Gnomes, right? I think everybody that's played D&D for a while has heard Tinker Gnomes. Well, I didn't have Tinker Gnomes in my world. They don't, they're not in Airline. I think I had them to a campaign or two just for flair, but they're not officially in Airline. Um, so, Cobalt's kind of became my Tinker Gnomes. So, you know, there. For those of you unfamiliar, at least my version of kobolds are like chihuahuas if they had humanoid hind legs and actual, you know, Small opposable animals. thumbs. <laughs> so, a little walking chihuahua uh, that thinks they're as clever as a dwarf. And everybody that's played role playing games knows about dwarven engineering. They can over engineer everything. You know, hey, there's this we cavern. Need that, machine, it needs a minimum a of a eight, eight. You know. 8 inch column they'll put in a 22 inch column just to be sure right but kobolds take it the opposite direction um, without understanding that they are and they will oh this 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 needs an 8 inch column they could be told that but they're going to put in a toothpick to try and hold it up because that's you know this will be enough that's enough yeah. <laughs> so everything they try and they're inventive but they can't make it a reality well, without it being dangerous they're also like they're ch yeah they're chihuahuas with ADHD yeah yes that's enough. Let's move on to the next thing. What? Oh, we want, we're going to build yeah. a trap over there. Let's go build like, a trap over there. For those that haven't read Blood of Ravens, there's a scene in there where there's a cobalt trap where they've taken giant logs and tied them back to trees on the side of the road on ropes so that they would, you know, when they're let loose, they'll and slam together in the middle of the road. They even sharpen some of the lo some of the, the branches on the sides to turn them into big spike logs. Well, to make sure they worked, they rode on top of them. And they were positioned so poorly that, A, you could have ridden a horse right underneath them without getting yeah, hit. Yeah, they were too high. And the spikes on each one pierced the riders on the other, and yeah, they killed themselves trying to... <laughs> Kamikaze kobolds. And that's how my kobolds always were, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, their first question, usually if they ran into what they re recognized were kobolds, was they would start looking for traps. And if there were traps, you could see their, their moods elevate. They were like, oh, we're good. Doesn't matter yeah. how many cobalt. Yeah. They're, They're traps. traps. <laughs> we'll just trip a trap. So let's I mean. sit back and watch the suicide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But and and this is where it always gets fun. And this was something that I was good for pointing out: um, player knowledge versus character knowledge. Yeah. If you had played in many of Rick's campaigns and you knew what cobalts were, if your party had not encountered cobalts, you had to keep your mouth shut and play dumb. Yep. Um, because your character didn't know. I would dock. Did. I would dock XP if you 
used yep. out of character knowledge. Exactly. Um, and for me, that always made it so much better, honestly. Um, and even when I'm editing his books, I will send him a message that says, no, he doesn't know that. That's player knowledge. Yep. Um, and we, that we communicate that way. So she'll, she'll read a scene and go, I know what you were talking about, but you forgot to put in some DM knowledge for the reader. Yep. Which means that I wrote too close to a character's perspective and didn't explain enough about what was going on outside of that for a reader to know what was going on. And Blood Ravens, that was probably two-thirds of the edits, other than grammar and spelling, that she needed me to do was, hey, fluff this a bit. Yeah, we it. need some DM knowledge. You have to remember, not everybody played this. Yeah. And and the reality is, is that while you know some of my characters have come up in books, they're not in situations that I ever played. 